Thank you uh, so much. Hello, and welcome to the session that's about money. <laughs> so, um, May, thank you so much for uh, such a sensitive introduction uh, and for really making a, a link that is not often, uh, that is not made often enough, which is the explicit link between the climate uh, and water, and obviously that's why we're, uh, we are here. I believe this is the most important room in the city at the moment, if not the world, so congratulations on an excellent choice. Um, so my name is Tom Ferguson, um, and I, uh, I'm with, Imag uh, with Imagine H2O, and we have had the privilege of organizing the, uh, the Financing Water Climate Solutions uh, a section of today, and our thanks, obviously, to the, uh, to the Governor's Office of Planning and Research for the opportunity to bring all of these brilliant minds together, both on stage and, of course, in the audience. So, for those of you who don't know who we are, Imagine H2O is a non-profit organization with the mission to empower people to develop and deploy solutions to water challenges globally. And in the last nine years, we've supported 90 alumni companies and hundreds more with the development of their companies and their business plans, and they are at the forefront of the fight for sustainable water management, and it's great to see quite a few alumni of our programs uh, here today. But today, we are focusing on the lifeblood of those solutions. Yes, indeed, the money, the cheese, the green. We're going to focus on finance. So we're going to see an overview of where we are at the moment on the financing of water climate solutions before really digging into the themes and case studies in green bonds, the deployment of private capital, and finally blended finance before wrapping up. Now, anybody who's seen the agenda for this session can see that we're going for kind of a fast jazz approach to this. We're going to cover a lot in a relatively short period of time. So, without further ado, I am delighted to bring on stage Henk Ovink, who is a professor at the London School of Economics and Harvard. It's quite the duo on the CV there. Special Envoy for International Water Affairs for the Kingdom of the Netherlands and Sherpa to the United Nations World Bank High Level Panel on Water to get us started. Henk, welcome. Wow, thank you. Um, finance, uh, climate, it's all related. Um, um, but I will, I will try to focus and take it a little away from the money to the values. Uh, because uh, too often we discuss water and finance and then lack the capacity to make a, a case uh, in, a, in our environment, in our communities around the world. And that is because we lack uh, actually the capacity to value water right. Um, we agreed on the 2030 agenda and SDG 6, the water SDG, is connected to almost all the other SDGs. Eh? Without water, there is uh, a lot of despair, migration, refugees. We have 25 million of them now. There will be 250 million in 2050. 10% of the African continent on the run. I don't know who of you is from the United States. How many people live in the United States? How many people? 300, 300 million? 340? Thank you. So that's that 34 million people on the run. Yeah? If you imagine 10% of African continent, 34 million of your American fellow citizens, Trump or non-Trump voters on the run. So <laughs> this is the future uh, we're looking at. Water is critically important connected to health. Uh, we have food programs that give food to people that are sick because they drink contaminated water. The food programs really don't help, people still die. 2.1 billion people in the world drink contaminated water. And if babies drink contaminated water, brain damage you cannot recover from. There is no pill uh, against it. Uh, and then not to talk about insecurity, wars, uh, poverty, urbanization, energy, and so forth. But water is also thanks to those connections, the leverage for change. And in the context of climate change, 90% of all natural disasters water-related, 80% of adaptation is water-related. So water is this key, this chain. But then we have to start to understand it better, value it comprehensively, and manage it inclusively. There is a strong economic case for investment in water. Benefit-cost ratios for investment in water and sanitation have re re been reported as high as seven to one in developing countries, OECD, 2011. Seven to one, if that's not a business case, I don't know. 
Benefits from strategic investments in water security could annually exceed hundreds of billions of dollars. Unfortunately, to date, strong economic case for water-related investment has failed to translate into a financial uh, case for investments at scale. So we lack the capacity, the instruments, but also the will uh, to get to investments sustainably in water. Financing water has to be proven to be difficult uh, because, amongst others, water is an undervalued resource. We don't price it or it surfaces. It's a human right, so there's a real challenge there. Water is undervalued. Water resources are also underpriced. Poor recovery for water investment. Sustainable water management requires costs to be recovered completely, whereby pricing is part of the solution. It's not the solution, but it's part of the solution. Tariffs are used, safeguards are essential. But we know that if we don't price water, it's the poor and vulnerable that pay five to 50 times as much for that same drop of water, often lacking actually a guarantee to the quality of that water because it comes by trucks. And knowing that it's women and kids around the world that have to walk the wells every day for hours, it's not only that we take the opportunity away from them to become part of their community and their progress and the kids can't go to school, it's also an economic loss for those uh, societies. So the economic downside as well as the equity and equality part of not having access to clean drinking water is actually hitting an economic and therefore a financial uh, bar. Water infrastructure is often capital incentive and calls for high initial investment followed by long payback periods. And water management generates a mix of public and private benefits in terms of valued goods and services, as well as reduced water-related risks. Many of these benefits cannot easily be monetized. So, I don't know, who of you is an economist? You can raise your hand. <laughs> we need you desperately need you to provide us the help in presenting business cases that don't focus on single focused approaches when you think about investment in water, but reach across the values of water, economic, social, environmental, as well as spiritual and cultural. Many of the benefits cannot be monetized and they undermine the potential revenue flows. Two years ago, two and a half years ago, actually, now, three years ago, uh, we started to work on this UN World Bank high-level panel on water. Why to raise water to the highest level of attention? We got presidents and prime ministers, the secretary general of the UN and the president of the World Bank to join forces. I was a Sherpa to the panel uh, for the last two years. Uh, I never knew what that was. Uh, I got this little cap. I really thought that I had to, but it meant you had to carry the load uh, for the, the men and women that actually carried the load of being responsible. And why was it so important to have sitting heads of states, heads of government? Ban Ki-moon at the first meeting of the panel said, I never had this before. It's a panel not of former heads of states that can advise from the side and say something nice or blunt. It's a panel of sitting executives. So whatever they say, they have to put into practice and action. And my prime minister was very clear in his conversation with me Make it actionable, Hank, otherwise I will jump out of this panel. Why would I otherwise be committed, my, will commit my time to such a panel? And the panel had said, we have to understand water better. Yeah? We have to value it across the board and manage it. And on valuing water, uh, we started a new initiative. Uh, initiated by the Netherlands in cooperation with the bank, uh, World Bank Valuing Water Initiative has one of the 14 actions of the panel. We limited to 14. We could have come up with hundreds, of course. Um, and we started with defining principles what valuing water actually could mean. And we did not do this from uh, our desks or behind uh, uh, in, in, in the offices of the prime ministers and presidents or in some of the basement of the UN where you can find yourself caught up for two days and wonder if there's, there's light out there. And it's, uh, <laughs> I think there, there were valuable moments uh, in that as well. Uh, but we went out to the world. We had sessions all around the world with communities, with businesses, with governments, with NGOs, with indigenous groups, with individuals uh, 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 and with institutes to understand better what those values and those principles could actually be. And we came up with five principles on water. One, recognize and embrace water's multiple values, 
to different groups and interest in all decisions affecting water. That means that a comprehensive approach when it comes to water, thinking about the economic, yes, financial, but also environmental, social, and spiritual, cultural values. Second, reconcile those values and build trust. Conduct all processes to reconcile values in a ways that are equitable, transparent, and inclusive. Now, trust is the toughest part in this approach of valuing water. In the Netherlands, we say it uh, comes by turtle speed and leaves you with the speed of a, 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 a cheetah. <laughs> Although we don't have cheetahs in the Netherlands, so <laughs> normally we would say horse, uh, but I just learned last week that a cheetah runs faster. Uh, but building trust is tough. Eh? It's not easy, and especially when it comes to what if you have no water or you pay 50 times uh, as much as the ones that are actually want to talk to you about water, or water is privatized, like in some countries, or there is no right to water, uh, then building trust is not the first or easy the most easiest thing to do, but it's critically important. Third, value and protect the sources. Critically important, those sources. We forget about them. Eh? We think about the economic models. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Cape Town, but it's not a good example uh, on how we deal with water. Eh? Uh, <laughs> surface water is lacking because of drought, and all of a sudden there's a crisis. Uh, and we close our eyes, and at the same time, the people who can afford it dig a hole in the ground and tap into those natural resources without it being metered, without, it being, uh, without them being challenged. So protecting the sources is critically important. Four, educate to empower and be educated. So this is not professionals talking to people on how things work. No, this is about collaboration and inclusion. That Education from the people to the government to the professionals is as important as the other way around. Empowering means an inclusive approach, and an inclusive approach means that you're open to everyone and everything. And of course, five, yeah, money, because Tom already started, ensure adequate investment in institutions, in infrastructure, in information, and innovation to realize the many different benefits derived from water and reduce risks. So it's not only money for the infrastructure, yeah, and there's a big gap in investment in infrastructure, it's the institutions that are critically important, the information and data to understand water's complexity, to move to next steps, and innovation to leapfrog. Yeah. Past solutions won't give us salvation for the future. Uh, no, uh, they will actually make sure that we will lose out. The panel members committed to putting these valuing water uh, principles into practice, uh, we cannot do it alone. Uh, we have to recognize the full range, and we need you all. So the Valuing Water Coalition started. We launched it at the High Level Political Forum in July. And we now have a group of businesses, governments, NGOs, communities, youth, uh, uh, across the board and across the world that are stepping up and stepping in and saying, I want to use these principles in my world uh, I want to apply them in my business. I want to apply them in the way I draft policy, in the way I work in a community, uh, in the way uh, a school thinks and works about water. You can all do this. Use these principles, put them into practice, and become a front runner. Uh, organize your network. Be, be, be a leader in this peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, we have coffee makers from the world that started in Panama, uh, we, in Colombia. We have a yeah, I stop. There's somebody in the back saying I have to stop, so I stop. Uh, <laughs> that started small, valuing water across the board of these principles. Now we have the bigger coffee makers, thanks to this first initiative at the table, uh, organizing 40% of the world's coffee production, finding ways forward to make water uh, a more valuable resource for them. We look at the beer industry, finance sector, banking, government, and so forth. So each and any one of you can join this movement. Uh, give me an email on LinkedIn or in this app. I think you can click me, uh, and then we're connected. Uh, make sure that we know uh, uh, that we can connect and join this Valuing Water Coalition, because Valuing Water is beyond the finance of water. And we need to make sure that we do it comprehensively and inclusively with all of you. Thank you.
Thank you, Henkin, for all of your fantastic work. Amazing news about the horse cheetah situation, huh? <laughs> There is no bigger task ahead of us, and the way we put it when we talk about this at Imagine H2O, it's a great place to work because there is, no, there is nothing more fundamental. It is the fundamental molecule that allows society to exist. There is nothing more important than what we're talking about at the moment. And so to move from all of the fantastic international work to specifically onto the financing element, uh, the, the, the fifth element of the, the, the list that you made, it's my great pleasure to introduce the wonderful Kathleen Dominique of the OECD to set the stage on financing water climate solutions. Kathleen, thanks so much for being with us. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. Uh, I came over from uh, Paris um, yesterday and just delighted with all of the excitement and energy here uh, that's happening around the climate and water space. Um, I have to say, uh, I, uh, Hank did a perfect job to set up what I'm going to talk about with you now. Uh, I work at the OECD. Uh, we're a think tank based in Paris. We work with governments principally, uh, really from all over the world. Uh, our member countries are advanced economies, but really the, the challenges we look at are global. And uh, because we're an economics-based institution, I feel also inclined to share some data and trends. So after all of the inspiration of this morning, please, uh, please bear with me. Uh, so just uh, before we get started on talking about some of the solutions and the opportunities for finance, just going to start by reminding ourselves of the challenge. And uh, Hank said this uh, perfectly. Here we have... Uh, really some figures that support this idea that, of course, investments in water have a strong economic case. So we look at um, the potential billions uh, that could be saved in terms of avoidance of costs and, and water risks. We have a strong cost-benefit ratio of many investments in water and supply and sanitation services. Uh, but, of course, I want to draw your attention to really the bottom um, left there and remembering really it's about people who need access to these services. And, and we're still uh, lagging far, far behind even if it's um, uh, 2018. Okay, well, of course, there's this economic case, right? So Hank explained very well uh, of that water has these many, many values, not just the economic value, but much broader environmental values, ecosystem values, et cetera. Uh, but, of course, this doesn't always mean you have a very good case for investments. So when you talk to investors, they say, very often, the first thing they say is, yes, but we, of course, we're investors. This means we want a return on our money. Different from philanthropy, right? So we've had this persistent financing gap, okay? We moved from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. Basically, that ra ratcheted up the ambition in terms of what we want to achieve, but it also means it's going to cost a lot more to get there. Of course, here's some figures just to give you a sense of magnitude of the challenge and really the financing that needs to flow into these types of investments in order for the benefits to be, to be uh, reaped. Now, of course, this is a financing solutions session. So what I want to do is now uh, share a few ideas about where I think there's opportunities and reasons for optimism, even if we look at these rather pessimistic figures. And the first theme is really around the green bond market, which has been growing extremely quickly. Uh, it's very exciting. The panel uh, is packed with experts who, who dig in deeper. But I just wanted to share a couple of um, a couple of key points from this. One is that the green bond market, according to some recent analysis from SEB, uh, has gotten very close to reaching, or has just reached the 500 billion mark cumulative issuance. That's a really big deal. But this is interesting because you have to kind of go through these uh, these uh, these deals one by one to figure out what really applies to water. And this looks at the issuance that would be eligible for investment in, in water uh, projects. So that's very exciting. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of that money will go to water investments, but it could go. And that's very good news because what it means is we see growing issuance. We see just topping $100 billion. Uh, in total issuance that would be eligible for those types of projects. This just gives a quick look in terms of who's making, who's issuing these these bonds. A lot of activity in the in the super uh, super nationals, uh, but really it's really across uh, sectors. So that's very exciting, and we're going to hear really the details and the and the power and potential of really having this type of market that can um, shift significant pools of capital uh, towards water related investments. Innovation. All right. Well, the organizers, um, Tom here and, and the team, 
have done an excellent job to kind of spotlight this opportunity. It's a very important one for many different reasons. We can talk about innovation and technologies that can reduce the costs of investments, so bringing down that, that gap, closing it on one side. We can also talk about innovation in terms of new financing models, so how can we think creatively about overcoming some of these, some of these issues. Um, we did some analysis looking at um, patent data over uh, the past two decades in over 200 jurisdictions around the world, and what's interesting to take from that is that you can see really a strong trend in growth in patenting uh, activity of water-related technologies. That basically means that the, there is a market out there. It's growing, um, which is very exciting for people in this business. This means that this, there's, there's a, a lot of opportunity to be had. We broke this out in a couple of categories, supply, demand, pollution abatement. But what you see is really strong growth here, especially on supply-side technologies. But all of them are, are trending in a positive direction. We also wanted to have a look and say, well, where is that innovation happening? Getting an idea of kind of the geography of that innovation. And this chart tells a couple of things. Uh, one takeaway, that big red dot there all the way on the right, the, that's the US, of course, uh, which is responsible for a lot of patent activity generally, of course. So we're not that surprised that you know there's a lot of strength here in terms of patenting in, in water-related technologies, but also it's quite interesting to have a look at the other players um, um, on the board there who are responsible for a significant share of water-related technologies. Korea is seen as a player, China, Germany, uh, Japan. Um, the, the, the ones, the countries where you have a greater share of those technologies go towards the right, and if you go up, this shows basically um, countries that have a particular specialization in water-related technologies compared to uh, uh, patenting and, and innovation in general. We can break this out by categories as well, so I'm just going to share this one on demand-side technologies, which is interesting because you can see, for example, the U.S. is, is there again, is responsible for many of this, uh, much of this innovative activity, uh, but we also have interesting cases like Switzerland, where you have a strong specialization in these types of technologies. Okay, the third opportunity area um, uh, that uh, is really getting a lot of tension right now is the area around blended finance. Okay, so um, we've been, we're actively working on this topic and many other people are. Um, so let me just start and, and say kind of what's the rationale for, for thinking about blended finance. Um, and which is basically the combination of development finance and using that in a catalytic way to mobilize additional sources of finance. So if we take a look at trends of development aid uh, over time, what we see is a trend in growth in overall aid, but we see the share that's allocated to water coming down a bit. Not much, but still trending downwards. And you can compare that, it co contrasts quite starkly with also trend related to aid going to the energy sector, which is which basically follows a trend in growth. So basically, the point here is that um, there's a, a small share of, of finance that's available from development uh, institutions, and we're going to have to use that in, in a more strategic way in order to grow the pie in terms of finance available. So when we're thinking about growing the pie, we want to look at, well, how can you use that you know, limited amount of development finance um, to help crowd in additional sources of, of finance? So finance from banks, finance from other investors, et cetera. And what we can see here is that if you look at this, um, the light blue there, it's a very small slice of this, of this ring. Uh, you, basically, this figure tells you that over these three years that we surveyed in OECD data, that about or $80 billion uh, were mobilized across these sectors. But water accounts for only a very small share of that. It's less than 2%. So the question is, and this is what we're going to discuss in the panel as well, as well, is how can we help to grow that pie so that others who are interested in getting in to that sector, how can that be done? Uh, so just to close, this is um, really uh, our, our work on uh, blended finance. Um, and basically this is saying, you know, development finance can come from public side, from the private side, and how can it be used in a strategic way to get more finance into, into the game? And that's really about growing the pie so that we have more money available uh, for funding these solutions. Um, I'm going to leave it there for now. I know we have a lot of interesting panel discussions uh, coming up, but I want to say that I, I know there's a lot of very 
uh, interesting experience in the room in water and finance and all across the board. And we would be very interested in continuing the discussion with you in the context of our roundtable on financing water, which is a joint initiative with the Dutch government and also the World Water Council. So please do get in touch and look forward to hearing uh, from you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Kathleen. Vital context for our, uh, uh, our conversations um, for the rest of this morning, and we're looking forward to having you back to lead the blended finance conversation in just a second. But before we get there, um, a huge pleasure for me to welcome our first of three rock star panels on tapping the capital markets, a discussion that's going to be focused on water-focused on water -focused green or climate bonds and their future in developing economies. Uh, two things. Firstly, if you're standing uh, at the back and you don't want to be standing at the back and you'd much rather sit in a chair, there are quite a few available here. So if you, would, if you do want to come and uh, sit down, obviously, you know, this, is a, this is a good juncture. No one will look at you in a, in a funny way. Um, <laughs> Uh, but if, and then with the, for the panel who I'm just about to announce, if when you uh, when I call your name, if you could come up and join us here with the uh, delightfully coloured microphones, that would be excellent. Firstly, uh, Eric Letzinger of Quantified Ventures, who's going to be our moderator. Welcome, Eric. Sean Kidney of the Climate Bond Initiative. Welcome, Sean. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mario Romero Orozco um, of Grupo Rotoplas, who are a, uh, a very generous beta partner of uh, Imagine H2O. Welcome, and Hervé Dutoy of a BNP Paribas. Welcome, all of you. Thank you very much for being here. Fantastic. We're good. Are we on? We're good. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Eric Letzinger. I'm uh, the CEO of a firm called Quantified Ventures. We structure environmental impact bonds. 80% uh, of these we do in the water space. We had the great luxury of working on the first one on the planet here with my esteemed colleague, George Hawkins, who was the former general manager at uh, DC Water. Uh, we've got some of the smartest and most handsome human beings on the planet <laughs> in the realm of green, uh, green bonds. So uh, without further ado, I will be the moderator. We'll stick with the uh, analogy of fast jazz, so no drum solos. We'll keep it sharp and punchy. If we could move right down the line, start with you, Sean. Quick introduction, who you are, who you're with, and uh, what you're doing in the green bond space. I'm Sean Kidney, CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative. We're kind of like the NGO for the green bond market. We work all around the world. Some of our biggest areas of work are in China, um, India, and Brazil. Uh, we have a certification, a standard scheme. We're currently working with the European Union and developing a regulated taxonomy, including water investments. I'm a member of the technical expert group, you'll know. Uh, and we, uh, we promote. So uh, we promote what the challenge is, climate change, we promote what the solutions are, and we promote the opportunity to invest in those solutions. Fantastic. Hervé? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm smart or handsome, but at least I work for a bank. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we underwrite green bonds. Um, by way of introduction, I've always been with BNP Paribas, which is a major uh, European bank. Um, for nearly 20 years, I've uh, been a trader, a manager of traders, and five years ago I switched my uh, time horizon span from an average of 18 seconds to decide whether I buy or sell to 50 years. <laughs> uh, that is m issues that will affect two generations ahead of us. Uh, and I created this uh, position of Chief Sustainability Officer for the Americas, uh, and which is about basically um, impacting society with what we do as a bank, which is very esoteric. Um, I know we have bankers who plant roof gardens and repaint classrooms, but we're not a paint company. <laughs> it's with swaps, options, uh, revolving credit facilities and bonds that we have to impact the world. So that's what we're trying to do. Fantastic. Mario? Uh, well, uh, I'm a chief financial officer of a uh, public trade company in Mexico. Uh, it's a Pan-American company that uh, offers uh, water solutions upstream and downstream to make uh, residents, commercial and industrials, more resilient. Um, we issued last year uh, the first sustainability bond in Latin America, and we are currently reopening that bond, so we're in the middle of the roadshow, uh, and uh, I hope uh, we get a good conversation today. Fantastic. All right, let's have none of that. Um, let's see here. Why don't we normalize our language? Maybe let's talk about terminology. Green bonds, uh, sustainability bonds, climate bonds, um, 4,000 different kind of names and nouns and verbs. Sean, maybe you want to level set on what a green bond is and what some of the other bonds are that fall under that umbrella. 
Well, it's important to note there's a lot of flavours to the solutions required. I mean, just going back to our first speaker, who so eloquently said to the challenge. It's not only adaptation, it's mitigation. Water pumps use about 5% of the world's electricity. In California, 17% of the state's electricity is pumping water around. So there's a huge mitigation agenda here, by the way. Um, uh, the kind of investment we have to make in the next uh, 30 years is about $90 trillion globally in infrastructure around the world, with water, wastewater treatment being a huge slice of that, in emerging markets in particular. Um, that's a, a current valuation of infrastructure globally is $50 trillion. Gives you a sense of the scale. This is going to be vast. Now, within that, there's all sorts of types of bonds and that are going to be produced. There's, we've seen um, green bonds, sustainability bonds, water bonds. You had a lot of talk by, from John Kerry about blue bonds. They're essentially, they're all part of the same theme, which is investments that will go toward address major climate changes, uh, ch climate change challenges. We call them all green bonds because if you put them in silos, you get an illiquidity premium per bond. So we call them all blue-green bonds, resilience green bonds, water-green bonds. That way the investors treat them all as one large pool and trade them, and you save 15 basis points. So it's, they're all the same thing. Fantastic. Okay. All right. We're clearing the terminology, right? Um, on the – okay. So it, we all come to these conferences, a lot of talk about green bonds. Uh, what's the true or baseline or uh, ground truth – uh, innovation with green bonds and what's the impact of green bonds? And I'll open that up to anybody who wants to jump in. Sure, there. so I can, I can uh, start with that. Um, so a green bond is a regular bond that you paint you, yourself green. So Okay, the, thanks the, for coming. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the innovation is actually. Uh, it's uh, th th what we call dedicated use of proceeds. So it's a bond where actually you indicate what you're going to use the, the money for. The, um, the real innovation, and you may hate me for a minute, uh, Sean, when, after I say this, but um, it's the least useful instrument, but I think it's the most powerful instrument. Um, in the sense that um, it's very powerful, uh, first because it achieves scales, uh, scale. Today we have pretty close to a half a trillion dollars of, uh, of uh, green bonds, and actually if we were to call it climate bonds, it's much more than that. And with scale comes lobbying power. Um, so, in fact, that's where the power of green bonds uh, comes in my mind. It has bring the conversation around the table, uh, f first around policy makers. Uh, when China was at the head of G the G20 a couple of years ago, a green bond was a, 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 a strong item on the agenda. And it, also, it has also bring the conversation within businesses and corporations. It has moved from sustainability departments to the executive committee, to the CEO, to the CFO, and to the chairman. Notably in BNP Paribas. And notably in BNP Paribas, absolutely. So for me, that's really where the innovation is about. It's about bringing the conversation, the topic, um, and, 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 and then stimulation, stimulating innovation way beyond the bond market to solve the, the issues we're talking about. Mario, anything to add there? Uh, yes, I, I think uh, there's another angle uh, on, on what Herve explained, which I think is uh, it's not only about doing uh, well or in finance, but also about doing good to the environment and to the social. And, and I think as we are on the second world show, the first time we, 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 we went was uh, 14 months ago. We're starting to find a crowd much more educated. And now they're starting to make the appropriate questions. And when you explain them uh, where the monies are going to be used and how that helps on climate change, then they start to, 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 to invest in those, in those bonds with a purpose. And I think that's that's another angle or, or, or where the innovation is coming from. Before, it was just uh, off-the-shelf products, and, and now it's starting to, to have it in a different way. Fantastic. Okay. Um, how do we begin the pro Well, let's hear with, with a half a billion dollars or half a gazillion dollars, can we go with a gazillion, <laughs> um, of green bonds in flight, um, where do we go from here to reach full scale? And I'll open up that. Uh, maybe, Sean, you want to get us started? Well, what is full scale? Like I said, about $90 trillion of infrastructure investment in the next 30 years. It's got to be basically green, otherwise our future is toast. So that's the scale we have to get to. And that's not just water, that's everything. Um, we have the money. This is something to bear in mind, by the way. There is no shortage of capital on the planet at the moment. We are flooded with capital. And large slabs of that 
are in zero or negatively rate bonds in Germany, in Japan, and so on. So we not only have capital, but we have the capital that wants yield, that needs a bit of yield. So if we can construct investments to pay a modest yield, the money will flow at scale. That's the background. So what have we got to do here? One is we have to recognise what it is that we've got to do. We've got to identify investments out there that qualify, tag the ones coming through the right kind, and by implications, screen out the ones that are the wrong investments. Look, if you've got a portfolio and you don't know what in your portfolio is consistent with the future, you've got a problem. If you do know what's consistent in the future, then get rid of the stuff that isn't. Just delete it. Now, there's a risk issue there, as regulators are beginning to recognise, around climate risk disclosure, the sorts of things that are likely to be impacted by the policy and the physical transition we're going through. Even Moody's recognised they've got a resilience metric now in their ratings. That's part of it. Refinancing, which is the green bo bonds are mainly a refinancing tool, is a way of recognising assets that are already out there that qualify or that are coming through that qualify, creating a market. So BNP Paribas boss can see that there is a future of making money in this. It's not just an esoteric thing to assign to a junior sustainability officer, which it was for 20 years, and now they can assign some good senior bankers to make all of this happen. That's part one. Two, we need to shift their whole water investment understanding at a technical level to sustainability and to climate risk. This is actually a pretty big issue. In most countries who work around the world, people are not dealing with adaptation issues. They're building infrastructure based on past history. Rainfall is changing, guys, like here, really dramatically. So that's a simple negligence issue we've got to deal with. And then finally, the public sector has to step up in three areas. It has to step up in demanding and requiring risk disclosure, which we're getting in Europe at the moment. We're, by next year, by middle of next year, it'll be mandatory for banks, for investors, to disclose climate risk going forward of all sorts. This is a result of the, the task force on climate finance disclosure. Second, we need a lot more blended finance instruments targeted at green, at a broad sector, as we were talking about blended finance earlier in the OECD talk. We see that happening. The Asian Development Bank, for example, is setting up three catalyst funds in Asia at the moment. IFC is doing this, so it's beginning to happen, but Jesus, we are way behind on that. And then third, from a regulatory perspective, we need to start thinking more aggressively about our licence to operate that we give to utilities and water bodies. When you take on a role in the private sector, or like Thames Water in the UK, of managing water infrastructure, there's a lot more than just delivering clean water. You have to manage it for the future. What does that mean in terms of the regulatory settings? Well, in the UK and the Netherlands, water utilities have fairly strong uh, tasks they have to p pursue, requirements from the regulator. But I'm going to tell you now, in the US, we don't have this across most states now. We have to aggressively scale up this system. If you're going to operate in this market, what have you actually got to do as a minimal requirement to deal with a future for our kids? There you go. Phenomenal. OK, everybody breathe. Um, <laughs> Hervé, you, you work for a large bank, so to what degree are the initiatives that you're working on that are germane to this kind of work, are they a sideshow within your bank and how much are, is the work uh, sort of integrated with more of the bread and butter activities within your bank? And if you could uh, work in the word, what do we get in there, slab, toast, and Jesus, I think I heard, yeah, if you could. <laughs> Wine coming next. Um, so it is really embedded in, in, our, in what we do for the most part, and I hate saying that because you can be suspicious when hearing my saying it. So let me backtrack a little bit five years ago of how it happened at BNP Paribas. All banks are doing great things, I think, on environmental finance, and we're just at the beginning. Um, one thing I think that differentiates us from, from other banks is the way it started, and it started at BNP Paribas from a very bottom-up movement. People like me stepping out from front office positions into um, what we call the functions, which are uh, second-class citizens in the HR, finance, tax, you name it, and sustainability. Um, we've started this movement, which after a couple of years uh, was more than 500 people, spending between 10% and 90% of their time depending. But it really started with people wondering how you can create val additional value to our clients with the existing products that we have. And I think that's, that's really became very pervasive within the investment banking division even though we have still 20 years ahead of work, ahead of us. But, but the idea is uh, our corporate clients uh, already are, um, have sustainability projects um, at, at the core of their strategy, and it's absolutely not to save the planet. It's simply because if you're 
a very famous uh, soda company and you have to close a, 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 um, a bottling company in India because you're starving a, a village from water, uh, it's a business issue before it's a saving the planet issue. <laughs> so th that's w issues that our corporate clients are facing. So the idea is, okay, now um, I'm financing these guys. I mean, their sustainability problem problems usually are a resource optimization problem, which is a re-engineering process uh, problem, which is basically a capital expenditure problem, which is now a banker's problem. So with the financing that we create, if we know that it's for a sustainable, sustainable purpose, can I create additional value to the client? And that additional value can be in tangible form, like a reduced cost of funding, that's the ideal. But it can be also in an intangible way <coughs> where because you're going to issue a green bond which, instead of a regular bond, but you're just painting it green, you're going to reach out to investors that you would normally not reach out, some dedicated green bond funds, for example. So you're broadening your invested base, which is a plus as a company. You also have an opportunity to communicate of a strategy, of a business strategy to the financial community and to crowds like yours and to my wife who's going to read Sean King's papers and so on. So you have a, a very powerful <coughs> opportunity to create additional value. So to your question, that's why it's not a product push. Uh, we have today probably more than 25 in investment banking products from sustainable supply chain financing to uh, green bonds to many other things. So it's, um, it's, the, it's the, 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 the roadmap of finance for the next 50 years. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Mario. Um, so are fixed income advisors ready to start to make that shift from selling letters, AAA, AA, bond rating letters to sustainability stories? And what's it going to take to make that shift? Uh, well, th that's, that's a very good uh, question. And, and, and I think that that's going to take some time. Uh, and I'm just going to share my experience last year. Uh, when I uh, uh, meet with all the bankers and I tell you, you know, we're going to be doing a sustainability bond. And all of them say, what? Yeah, a sustainability bond. And we're going to be the first in Latin America, the second in the Americas. And how do we eat that? Uh, so I think the, they are used to just sell easy bonds, which is, this is a double A plus, and the rate is this and that and, and, and that. So now what you're asking them is to move more like to an equity side, that they have to get into a roadshow, they have to explain what it's ESG, what's a climate bond, what is a green bond. And at the beginning, it was kind of a, a little bit uncomfortable for them. You know, uh, instead of just doing a quick fee, uh, they n now need to work. Uh, long story short, after we priced the bond, which we got close to four times oversubscribed. Uh, four times four, oversubscribed. That's four times. This is unusual, folks. Uh, uh, now there are the experts on sustainability. And now with the reopening, uh, we're doing another roadshow, and they are doing the work. So uh, I think that shift uh, needs to, uh, to happen. And I think the market forces will eventually force all the bankers to do so. And the reason is there's already $23 trillion globally managed under ESG screening. And only half a trillion is bonds. So I, I don't know why the difference is so big, but eventually that will need to move also into the, the bond marketplace. And that will force bankers on the debt side to go and tell stories about what, how it's all uh, sustainable and how it's not only doing about good financially, but also well on environmental and social issues. I just would like to add one element Please. on this. Um, you all know probably that we need five to seven trillion dollars of investments a year to reach um, the SDGs by 2030. We also have every year 22 trillion dollars that are going into savings. So 
it's there. The money is there, in, and, and, and you can spend two-thirds of it on non-sustainable stuff. So that's, the, the, that's where the, the, the challenge and the, the opportunity is, is to create the bridges between that need of $7 trillion a year with this pile of money that every year each of us collectively do save, which is three times as much. Yeah, good. Um, a ray of sunshine. Um, <coughs> and, a, and a bridge. <laughs> and a bridge. So, the, um, so, with, so let's hone in on water, right? Clean water, sanitation, roughly 11% of green bonds that roughly comport to what you under, your understanding is. Is this the tip of the iceberg? Are we uh, flattening out? How we... Um, Where's this going? So the green bond market grew 80% last year. Uh, it's been growing at an unbelievably steep curve, as you will have seen from that slide earlier on for the last few years. We expect growth to level off this year to be only 40%, and then we expect it to go to 100% the following year. There's a whole reason, macroeconomic situations around that, deleveraging in China, um, the slightly lunatic Republican tax bill here, allowing companies not to have to issue bonds because they're bringing repatriating profits, all sorts of reasons why this year is flat. That is only 40% growth. So that's the first point to note. Uh, the second point to note is the scale of what we have to do, which is the underlying driver, is extraordinary. You know, San Francisco Public Utilities, which has issued um, uh, a few certified climate bonds so far, has got a fairly big CapEx program. That is nothing compared to what's got to happen in Sao Paulo, which has the wrong water system for which change climate and had a massive drought a few years ago and <clears throat> nearly ran out of water. The reserves went down to 8%. So their infrastructure has to be now reconfigured to suit what is a new climate that they already have, let alone the kind of climate we're going to go into if we get 4 to 6 degrees Celsius, which is we're currently on the target for. So how do you manage that risk factor? How do you build infrastructure that you can rejig in 50 years' time if we lose the climate battle totally? What does that mean for the future? There's a lot to be done here. I want to stress, though, while we need a bit of R&D, most of what we have to do, we know how to do. This is not new technology area. This is the application of existing knowledge on steroids. That's the point. And if you start thinking about that, well, well, I can tell you, just in India, we expect a few trillion dollars of water infrastructure to be built in the next few years, between now and 2025, which has to be climate-proof, climate-resilient, low energy, that is um, good for mitigation, etc. All of that's green bonds or green finance. Green bonds are just a marketing tool, right? It's a way of identifying what you've got to do, reporting to the investors, and so on. What counts is how the money's spent. That's the underlying work. But I can, I can tell you that the investors love the idea that someone else is doing their due diligence and vetting for them and reviewing it, which is most of the independent market. So when San Francisco Public Utilities did their bond, they got an independent company to come in and verify their climate change claims critical factor in giving the investor some confidence in this market. That's why the green bonds marketing theme, like a fair trade coffee label, is useful. But it's the underlying work that's now the challenge. You know, we haven't got much time, folks. You know, the climate talk clock is ticking at unbelievably fast. We are, we've lost the first battle. We will see two metre civil rises. We will see two degrees warming. What we're on a fight now is to see if we can avoid four to six degrees Celsius warming, as Jim Hansen says, we're likely to get, and probably four to six metre sea level rises by the end of this century, current thing. In the 16th, last thing, in the 1600s, this, in case you haven't read Jeffrey Parker's book on climate on the global climate crisis, we saw a massive drawdown of carbon in the Americas because we killed off 95% of the population of smallpox and measles. And as a result, forestry growth sucked carbon out of the atmosphere. It caused a mini ice age. In the 1600s, a third of the world's population died as a result. A third, in every continent, that is. That's what we're heading into again. Heat this time instead of cold. Did everybody just feel the ray of sunshine go away? <laughs> <laughs> um, the bridge Sean, is still there. Sean, <laughs> <laughs> That's right, um, Sean mentioned uh, Moody's stepping forward and basically requiring some climate change uh, or climate risk. Uh, as part of um, uh, bond ratings. Are you seeing implications of that in discussions in the hallways of your large bank? What are the implications of that? Yeah, it's a, it's a trend. Uh, it's, a, it's a trend demanded by investors. It's a trend demanded by regulations in, in Europe. Um, 
we used to call these, these elements extra financial rating. Um, and in fact, uh, let's stop calling it extra financial rating. It's financial, it, it's financial uh, information at the end of the day. It does impact the long-term credit uh, of, of companies we, we deal with. Uh, at the bank, and we're one of two banks, to my knowledge, doing this, uh, and it's not fun, but we are integrating um, a shadow, shadow carbon prices, ca sh shadow carbon price, uh, when we do credit analysis of the companies we, we lend money to. So obviously when we do it, it puts us put, it, we, we lose the deal because others don't, but um, because it, it, it increased sometimes the price of credit. But it's, it's something that's important to do to, to test how resilient companies are uh, to, to, to long-term climate uh, issues. Mario, you've expressed a lot of interest in um uh, the interest of millennials uh, disrupting the uh, financial markets. Um, how do you see those trends progressing? Uh, you know, uh, I think that could really accelerate uh, the whole uh, sustainable green bond, climate bond market. And the reason is, uh, first, there's, there's a big asset rotation from the boomers to the millennials. Uh, they're going to be managing around $24 trillion by 2020. Uh, and the millennial generation, as opposed to the previous generations, they are much more aware about sustainability. They really are worried about what type of world they're receiving. So once they have the money in their pockets, now they're starting to ask their bankers again, uh, that they want to have exposure to different asset classes uh, that have a good compliance on ESG or a sustainable bond or so on. So if it starts in the money, I think that's going to create a rapid change regarding uh, this untapping of, 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 of the capital markets. Uh, and there are going to be the companies, private and public, faced with the situation to do ESG or to comply with ESG uh, better, either by conviction or by convenience, but they will need to do so. Uh, the awareness is, r is rising fast, and I think the millennial generation is, is the ones that are going to make that happen uh, to move faster. And if I may add, uh, in addition to millennials, you also have women. Uh, women's health, wealth um, has been increasing over the past 20 years with m more women in the workforce, inheritances, and many other ways. Uh, it's another driving force uh, because we know, like millennials, um, impact is on, on top of their mind as well. They understand the future better than men, is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's, let's close out with just some final thoughts. Uh, you've got an, an attentive group here. Um, Mario, maybe we can start with you and we'll move back down the line. You want to just give some final thoughts about what do we need to do? What's the work ahead of us to scale this stuff? Uh, and what's the work ahead to make sure that, um, that green bonds directly connect to the impact that we hope and, uh, and um, are working to make sure that they do? A couple of things. One is education uh, of all sorts. Uh, Decomplex all this terminology, ESG, uh, climate green also, and I think we need to decomplex that and educate the market and people about how to connect uh, sustainability with their money, with their pension funds, and so on. Second, a new generation again, 86% of them like sustainability investing. So those two things could be big drivers for untapping the capital markets. Hervé? Two thoughts. Um, the first one is I hope that you, you've seen that finance can be fun <laughs> <laughs> and help society. Um, the second one is that um, the future, uh, this is really what the future of finance is about, uh, that um, cost of funding a, until recently was only tied to your ability to repay when you do a loan. And in the future, it will of course be tied to your ability to repay, but also to your ability to do good. John? 
you know, if you're ever dealing for treasurer in an institution or someone who can issue a bond, tell them they can get better money, more loyal money, longer term money if they do it green. This is a different conversation. We've never been able to have this conversation in the sustainability world before. And that's our opportunity. We go to the treasurers now. We don't go to the sustainability people or the environment people. We say to them, you make your stuff climate proof and you show the world that it's climate proof or climate resilient or climate ready, you'll be able to finance things better. That's the change we're experiencing now. This is an incredible opportunity to push a really strong agenda around the right kind of water infrastructure for the future. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And let's thank the, uh, this esteemed, and by the way, these are validated the most attractive people in the green bond space. Uh, thanks to all of you and thanks to the panel. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Um, Eric, Sean, Mario, Ave, uh, absolutely fantastic. We are now going to switch gears to move from the mobilization of debt to the mobilization of equity. This is the bit that all of the, we're particularly interested in because we deal with early stage companies uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and this is the conversation where we're gonna dig into uh, the private markets. Um, so the, uh, the panel is gonna be looking at investing in innovation, financing the development and adoption of emerging technologies. And you're in for a real treat because the three people who are coming up on stage are the real deal. Capital T, capital R, capital D. First, we have Steve Close of True North Venture Partners, who's been a judge for every year of our accelerator selection process and true supporter to IH2O. He gives a two-hour session to our accelerator companies each year. And for all three of the times I've heard it, um, it's pretty much the same each time. And every time, it's blown the brain out of the back of my head. He's the best, he's the best advisor and thinker about early-stage water companies that, that we've ever come across. Um, secondly, we are privileged to welcome Dr. Andrew Benedict who is the chairman and CEO of Anagir, and it's not overstating the case to say that he is a genuine legend in the water entrepreneurial community. And moderating uh, our, our session um, is Nicole Neiman Brady of Renewable Resources Group, who has been a wonderful addition to our judging group with the Accelerator and as an overall advisor to our work. And so welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Tom. So uh, it's hard to follow that act with Eric, I don't know if many of you know that he, uh, the mo prior moderator was a comedian. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do my best here. Um, but first we're gonna go through a little round of introductions, but uh, it's important to know that what we're trying to hit on here is how innovation can really spur us to meet our climate goals. So I'm Nicole Neiman Brady. I'm the COO and principal at uh, Renewable Resources Group, and we focus on investing in uh, projects in water, particularly, that's the main focus, but also as it relates to energy and agriculture. Uh, we have projects around the world, uh, mostly in California, Mexico, Chile, and Australia. But my background is actually, I started um, and spent most of my career in energy. And that's important to note because there are a lot of lessons I think we can learn from the energy sector and bring them over into water. Um, I spent uh, a good deal of my career as an officer and executive at uh, Edison International uh, in charge of all of their uh, energy procurement for, uh, for Southern California. And uh, from there I started a water um, development company focused on uh, small scale distributed water treatment, wastewater, and for drinking water purposes, and then joined um, RRG, as we call it. Uh, turning it over to Andrew. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm uh, a kind of academic that got lost on the way. <laughs> I uh, thought I can solve the world's problems by being a professor of chemical engineering and environmental science. And then I realized that papers don't solve problems. You actually have to try it and do it commercially. So I quit and founded a water company, water technology company in membranes. I, I had this conviction that membranes are the way to get water reused. And I felt that water reuse is going to be an enormous problem. Uh, unfortunately, I was more than right because I knew nothing about climate change at this period. Nonetheless, uh, the water reuse has become an issue it's, it's a continuing, fastest growing, one of the fastest growing markets in the water space. And uh, eventually my former company, which was called Xenon, was purchased by General Electric, and today it's owned by Suez. 
Uh, I, I went to San Diego to have a perfect life and not ever work again. <laughs> but then unfortunately I got interested in climate change. I got a job at uh, Scripps and I started watching the ocean, understanding what's happening. And there's no weather patterns in the ocean, it just keeps getting warm. And that got me out of there specifically to find technology at the technologies to solve the climate change issue in the realms that I knew, which was uh, wastewater treatment. Then I realized there's much more to be done if I add food waste and organics to generate energy, water, and fertilizer, and that's what I'm doing right now. So I'm Steve Close. I'm a chemist. Um, my career mostly has been research and development on water technologies. Um, I spent uh, time at General Electric their water business and was there when uh, we acquired uh, Andrew's business. And so I got to know him a little bit through that and then a lot of, I mean, the phenomenal talent you had in your company and those product lines uh, that really were transformative in the world. Did some stuff internationally in China, spent some time there a few years in Singapore as well and um, kind of globally. And then uh, moved over to the investing side to, to True North. But we're kind of more of a hands-on operational investor. We're, um, we don't have a 10-year fund, ours is an evergreen, and we invest when we think there's a chance to really make a transformation and want to see that through. So it's, it's kind of like my R&D roles before where you know, a company gives you a budget, you're trying to invest in new things that you know, hopefully can move forward, and that's kind of very similar to what I do at True North. Perfect, thank you. So the first thing I think we want to address is really what does the, the climate look like right now? Um, we're all very fortunate to be here um, with Imagine H2O sponsoring this, this section of the, the Water Pavilion, and they do a tremendous amount uh, to encourage innovation. But really, what is it like for um, the entrepreneur right now, and what is it like for the investor who's trying to, to look at this space. So fortunately, we have entrepreneurs, we have investors, we have a little bit of both. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to t turn it to one of you to, to, to tell us, what do you think the, the entrepreneur is facing right now, Andrew? The uh, water sector has um, got a magnificent market that's growing and that's been highlighted. But it's also got probably the greatest inertia of any business. And if you really look at America, and this is, uh, for, I, I'm a global guy, but I live in America, so I see America mostly. If you look at the American market, it's, it's a great market. And yet, there are very few innovations that actually make it to market. I would say in the last 20 years, Nothing significant has made it to market that was developed in America and tested in America. Stuff that comes to America is often technologies that were tested and proven outside of America. So that tells you, not that Americans are stupid, it tells you that the system is rigged against innovation. And, and it's still difficult to do this, green bonds or otherwise. Yeah, certainly with the, the regulatory hurdles and uh, some of the challenges, uh, procurement and, and who the buyers could be of, of the potential technologies, it's really quite, really quite a challenge to, to get investments going. So water is challenging, um, no, but it seems like uh, things are slowly moving in the right direction. They have been for years, so just a few things. So like water rates have been rising globally two to three times uh, the global inflation rate. So water is, you know, getting to be more valuable, and as, as it gets more valued, uh, you know, there's there's more economic opportunity for innovation as well. I think, like, if you, you know, the total spend globally on water uh, overall is somewhere between maybe 450, 500 billion or so. Uh, but of that, there's maybe maybe about 10 billion or so, depending on how you slice it, is really on advanced treatment technology, similar to the technologies that Andrew invented and brought to the world, and, and now are really incumbent in full scale. And so of that, of that uh, 10 billion-ish or so number on advanced water treatment technologies, that sector is growing really pretty fast. So membranes, for example, which you know, Andrew pioneered the low pressure hollow fiber membrane technology you know, industry, 
that that has been growing, you know, a good 8, 10% globally or even higher at many times. So I think like for entrepreneurs, it's like money, you know, water's coming more in the money, plus there's more regulation and more kind of interest in sustainability. These climate change issues are becoming more real, are causing more problems and acute problems that need to be solved. The economics are kind of there. And then the kind of more exciting advanced area of water, kind of the water industry is definitely growing at a reasonable pace. So I think it's kind of, it is tough, it is difficult, but sort of like glass half full. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to also take a look at the, the venture capital market. Um, in uh, 2017, 0.05% of uh, investments from venture capital firms went into to water. Um, that's uh, I think it was, it's around 150 million or something along those lines. It's a, it's it's a drop in, drop in the bucket. Um, so, but so just to just to th throw something on there. So like Andrews, he, him and his company made a ton of money because they had yeah. something unique. And in water, it's interesting. You've got some very very large big companies that you know are the incumbents. Then you then you have a lot of really small like startup ones. You don't have many companies that sort of get going. And those are the ones that do, it's like there's a hole. And, and the valuations these companies get are like crazy relative to other sectors, like on the high side, like irrational exuberance once, once one of once these companies come, yeah. pop, pop through. So like Nano H2O, you know, they sort of found a way to get in business, get 10 million of revenue, and LG buys them for $200 million. It's a 20X, it's not an EBITDA multiple. EBITDA's like <laughs> way negative. Right? <laughs> Can't have an EBITDA multiple then, but at like a revenue multiple. Same thing, same thing with Inga. Yours company was relatively mature and still was a high multiple on, on revenue. By, by the way, we have a, an agreement prior to the conference we discussed, I'll depress you, and he'll cheer you up. <laughs> <laughs> sun, sun shining and, you know, going away. Uh, once a market is made, then actually the guys that pile into it can also make money. That's what Steve just outlined. It's the breaking into the market that can be done, but it takes a really long-term, patient, impact-oriented investors and the unusual imaginary utility owners. And there are, some, there are some here in this room, but without those, nothing happens. I think we need to accelerate it, and that's perhaps what this program might help to do. Okay, guys, so what's gonna change in the next five years? How are we gonna start meeting our climate goals through innovation? What's, how are we gonna get investors in this space? <laughs> like, like what Steve said, it will happen only if there is demonstrated technology that inspires others to copy, to be blunt. And of course, the original company may go on and be successful as well. So we're uh, building right now a um, very large plant outside of Los Angeles to handle sludge. <clears throat> and food waste, convert it to fertilizer and energy. And I, I think probably in California, there'll be about 100 more of these gonna, gonna get built. We'll build some and others will build the rest. This in itself is a huge market. So there are niches like that, that will get money once it's demonstrated. And I, I think, like, you know, economics just do a lot to make things happen. And I think, uh, you know, I mentioned the water rates are going up. And we're seeing this resource recovery really start to happen. So, like, Vitans is a, is a very innovative utility in the U.K. They're a drinking water utility. They just do drinking water. So they use, like, a lot of lime in their drinking water treatment. They're now recovering that lime, and they're selling that lime as a product. They're actually the humic acids that they remove as part of the water treatment process. They're, they're selling that now as well. They actually have moved from like a net surp like revenue generator instead of like the raw materials that they buy. They now are making money from that. We're we're seeing um, like uh, nutrient recovery, struvite recovery from wastewater treatment plants. Or like we have George Hawkins here that he was maybe who you're referring to. Where, you know DC water like massive amounts of anaerobic digestion on you know, biogas production, and really thinking holistically about wastewater treatment. I think in the past, utilities, like if you're a utility boss, 
Like, can you try something different? And if it's successful, like, you're not going to get a massive pay raise and a huge promotion. It's, you there's get no, nothing. It's, there's no equity. Like, you're not going to. But if you screw up, you're out, right, for sure. So the system is stacked against you. And the engineering firms, they, it's all about risk for them, too. They have almost no it. But we're starting to see some of that change, especially as, like, um, municipalities and city councils and people begin to see that there's an opportunity here. And we do have forward-thinking utilities that are leading the way and setting an example. And I think people are looking at going, hey, you know, this idea of a more sustainable resource recovery and this intersection with energy and water, energy reductions really have a big impact on the bottom line. And a lot of these advanced technologies, they do things like capital avoidance. Like, we can, we can smartly, you know, deal with the issues that we have here. And it's, it's, it's a great thing for the ratepayers as well. And so I think that economics piece is really beginning to happen, and it's a, it's a driver. Yeah, yeah um, <clears throat> he and I always agree, by the way. So <laughs> <laughs> the um, interesting addition that I think is going to be important is the impact-oriented family office funds. And the more the climate change is de depressing us, the more we want to do something about it. Yeah. So these funds are long-term patient money. So if you're an entrepreneur starting a company, this is what you look for. Um, and also what's very interesting is that even if it goes slowly here, it goes fast in Asia. So for example, we've been trying to develop a, a plan to fully recycle waste to energy. Uh, we built uh, one much faster in India. India, which everybody thinks is poor, uh, has adopted this, they have a huge program to change the country. They have a leader, which is a, a tea boy as opposed to a rich boy. So they, he is really keen to make a change. And it, it just like think about the developing world, like in some of these places that don't have like a lot of infrastructure. Are they going to build a massive centralized infrastructure? Like there's no way that's going to happen. So it's all happening more decentralized. And I think there's been a lot of advancements in decentralized uh, uh, technologies and decentralized yeah. treatment. And even in advanced developed economies, like instead of like doing massive retrofits and redesigns and huge amounts of capital on existing facilities, maybe thinking about, well, this actually part of town is experiencing some growth. Let's have a small distributed um, uh, you know, wastewater treatment with recycling and reuse here. And so I think we're seeing like a change instead of just like kind of good old standard 80 year ago type wastewater treatment, really thinking about it much more smartly. And this can be done much more cost effectively and advantageously. Yeah, no, I, it's music to my ears to hear the distributed solutions. Um, we did uh, several projects that were focused on on-site water reuse for large campuses um, and also uh, drinking small drinking water projects uh, that focused on brackish desalination um, where the water was cheaper than importing. Um, it just, by, the time, by now, the technology is so advanced. I want to turn us a little bit to, to some advice uh, because I think you know you've you've made some good points already on um, what uh, what entrepreneurs should be thinking about in terms of okay so large family offices of um, super wealthy I think that is a very good place however it's hard for the the starting entrepreneur to get there um, going internationally uh, also very good advice what else what other tips and thoughts can you impart on, upon how uh, to really get someone's company going, to find funding, et cetera. Because if you think about it, there aren't many VCs that focus on water. There's a handful, and they make one to two de deals a year. Um, True North makes uh, um, some as well, but there's, uh, you're not quite as dedicated to water. You have a broader mandate. We have a broader mandate. It, it's hard, it's hard to, to find the support and the resources. What, what tips would you give? Um, that's a very difficult question. And um, if you really look at startup companies in the US, as uh, Steve pointed out, they, they go to a certain size until the guy runs his own little shop. And then typically they falter. And they falter because they, they don't have the funds to have a balanced system of sales and management, so they, they sell something and they don't know how to deliver it, and they're, they're in this valley of death. And frankly, the funds that do, the venture capital companies that have come in, 
uh, sometimes actually being more disruptive than helpful mm -hmm. to these companies. So it's a very critical mm -hmm. position where you really have to find uh, long-term patient money or you have to go extremely slowly and <coughs> not get into uh, a pitfall which usually eliminates these companies or, or they get bought out cheap on the dollar. Uh, as crazy as this might sound, uh, if you're an American company, you may want to start in Asia, uh, literally. <laughs> because I think Asia is where the need is. Asia is much more open to technology. We have such enormous inertia, like I said before, to overcome to get to scale. So if you find the right location, or maybe find an Asian partner, that could really help you get through this valley of death. I'd say I think on the uh, investor side, sophistication and domain experience in water is really, really important. Uh, it, you know, I think, especially like the, some of these family offices, uh, and we're part of a family office network at True North, that there's a lot of desire to do something. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to lose a lot of money if you don't know what you're doing because you feel really good about something and you want to do something and there's a drive to deploy capital to make a difference because you know we have to do this and you can lose a lot of money that way. So sophistication and, and knowing what you're doing is really important. From the entrepreneur and innovator perspective, I think today sometimes there's a little bit too much emphasis on getting a story. And the story is really important, but like if it's sort of just a story but it you know, it's not really right. I think that's, so I think you f try to really focus on the problem to solve. Don't necessarily be so wedded to be an advocate for your own technology that you first conceived over your own idea and you're forcing it forward. It ha you have to think about the, what problem I, am I uniquely solving? Understand the incumbents and the context and then also understand, I think like Andrew was saying, that. The, 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 the first markets to address might not be in your backyard. Have an understanding and awareness. Maybe be a little bit slower to get that great sounding story and the great looking pitch deck that sort of is kind of nothing when you're, you know, because it's just like that's all it is. Really iterate through, understand the problems and iterate through on the solution set to find something that's unique and then be okay with finding, you know, wherever the right entry markets are to give it a try. I actually, um, I think a good way to think about it is, you know, um, you may uh, invent the best motor ever, but you need to make sure that there's a car you can put it in. Um, and you know you have to think about it holistically and really think about the whole solution. And uh, sometimes a lot of the technologies I've seen, at least, are very much a solution looking for a problem. The uh, nature of this industry is um, that it's fully open, like uh, government bids and, and so on. Um, and, and there's a lot of players. So, but the people that start companies generally are technologists. And they only look at their technology. And they look at, uh, look at the fact that they have a green, uh, a green uh, bolt versus another guy who has a yellow. I mean, I'm just exaggerating here. The point is that they're so focused on, on their technology better than anybody else's that they truly never examine is this saleable, given the long cycles? What will it take to get there? So frankly, most companies that start never have a chance for good reason and sh probably shouldn't be there. This is not the same in some other industries. So uh, I, I think the, the issue really is uh, business is hard and business is slow. So unless you have something remarkable that's different, and you are as a person different and willing to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, you're, you're not going to make it, period, no matter who finances you. So competition, understanding competition is critical. And when I look at successes in, in the world, they're often, you know, entrepreneur dependent in this sector. Okay, sw switching it a little bit, um, I want to talk a a bit about the role of government and uh, what we can learn from um, countries like Singapore 
and activities in, in Ontario, Ontario, Canada that have um, really spurred some innovation. And uh, this is where I will make a little tie into the energy sector because even here in California, um, I witnessed firsthand the development of uh, the renewables sector and how it uh, grew with the, the state mandates to uh, increase renewable percentages and uh, Governor Brown just uh, increased it that much further. Um, you know, every time the increase gets put onto uh, the energy sector to increase the percentage of renewables, it seems impossible, uh, yet we somehow meet it. And with it comes reduction in costs, with it comes innovation, and if you look at the prices of solar panels, that didn't happen by accident. Now the prices are really low. Um, when I first uh, started working in, in the energy sector, um, solar PV contracts were being sold for 150-ish megawatt hour, dollars per megawatt hour. Now uh, Mexico just had a clearing price of uh, 26 for large scale. Um, solar. So that kind of improvement needs to happen in the water space as well. But a lot of it is was spurred by regulation and uh, gov the government hammer. Um, Singapore has a lot of incentives, Ontario, Canada as well. Um, what are your thoughts and the lessons that we can bring here? I uh, had, uh, I lived in Ontario and now I live in the uh, U.S. and California this great state, um, because I like the climate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've uh, been an advisor and recipient of a, the, the, the first prize in Singapore. So I've been an advisor ever since to the Singapore government. And I also been an advisor in Israel, which is maybe the third of the regions that actually focus on trying to create a water industry. Um, what uh, the, uh, these regions all have in common is a much more significant level of helping startups, funding grants with grants, uh, initial testing, uh, and so on. It, it, in um, Ontario, that's very clear. Singap Singapore. But they don't, Ontario doesn't do, doesn't do test bedding like Singapore does. The Singapore PUB is always open to help people develop new technology. They have great leadership, technical leadership that understands what the world needs and they, they test bed. So we're working with them right now and we did before too and that's how the water reuse started. Israel also has some test bedding programs, but Israel is very high in funding startups. So if I look at these three regions, what does America have that these people don't? Um, America has a huge market. And America is where most of these people ultimately wind up whenever they start trying to sell their wares. Um, and in California, we're fortunate to have a market creating mechanism for energy. And so this has been very helpful to my current company. I don't know to what extent California has that for water, but California has shortages, water shortages. In the, in the case of energy, and if it relates to water, there are grants from California Energy Commission and so on to reduce the water use. And it's remarkable how much water can be, how much energy can be reduced in our water conveyance and the water delivery system. So I, I've spent a lot of time in Singapore and Israel and elsewhere like Andrew, so I'll, but I'll answer it a little bit differently. I think like if we look at um, what's happening here in California, what this big, AB 100 bill that Governor Brown just signed on moving to 100% renewables by 2045. The kind of a metric in there is this carbon intensity, like this score, this, which is not just CO2, like methane and other greenhouse gas. It's all kind of brought back to a CO2 thing, so it makes it simple and easy. You measure the carbon intensity of something. It's a wonderful thing. And I've just been really thinking about that a lot and think about like the water. Like 
like if we had and think back to the green panel green bond discussion about like you know bonds that you know are going to be for the right type of assets that are relevant into the future I started to think like what if we did a little bit more on that and had like a water sustainability index where we could look holistically sort of like the carbon intensity thing is how does the world look before how does the world look after and what's that change on the greenhouse gas thing like what if we had something similar on the water intensity and we, then we can think about various sources of water i think what's really interesting is we're seeing like public perception begin to change on things like potable reuse direct potable reuse there's places in texas like of all places where they are drinking essentially wastewater now well treated wastewater and it's much better than the regular stuff and it's it's a lot of working with people and and you could say that's kind of a government really doing a socialization of the community be, getting people on board and advanced technologies but that like tapping that water resource globally is probably a much better thing than doing a lot more seawater desalination which is still needed in many places but I'm just wondering if we had more like a scorecard of like a water sustainability index or something like that that we could use to kind of measure against where governments, and maybe it would be different locally, where governments then could use that and say, this is what we're going to do with our score, and they got to meet this hurdle. It would then spur us to do more things like that, recycling, and some of the stuff you're doing at Edison going after impaired waters that are easily accessible and treated, treatable, right. stuff like that. Uh, as always, um Steve makes me want to add something. <laughs> uh, what uh, I think we, we all have to realize is that climate change and the growing population together spells disaster in water availability. So if you look at 2030, we're going to be missing 3,000 cubic kilometers, cubic kilometers, not cubic meters, hmm. which is giga meters, we're going to be missing that amount of water. If all that water is going to be desalinated water, it's going to mean uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, equal probably to what the U.S. does now. It, it's an enormous amount if you use desalination. If you use uh, recy recycled water. Unfortunately, we won't be able to provide all that water to recycling. We won't be able to provide it even through all the savings and improvements which are all really needed and should be done. All water should be recycled. We will save a lot of this energy and enable people to live and grow food. The big issue with climate change to my book is going to be arable land and irrig irrigating that land and growing food. I, I think we're going to be facing famines. So uh, we're about to get the hook here, um, but I, I, I think it's um, I, th I think this panel has brought up a lot of interesting points, both from the investor perspective, the entrepreneur, the um, the government, and the way that we can build some sort of balanced scorecard or um, a menu of options, whether it's uh, water reuse goals, uh, desalination, uh, stormwater capture we didn't even touch on, um, and conservation and uh, efficiency e efforts. You know, if you think about uh, going, tying this all back to wh where we started this part of the, the panel um, on innovation and, and what needs to happen to spur uh, us getting to climate change goals, um, innovation doesn't necessarily need to happen at the company level. Uh, or at an individual level. It can really happen in the government. It can really happen uh, with investors and, and, and going down different paths. So I think um, this group, and thank you very much, Steve and Andrew, for your, your insight. Um, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna wanna reach out to you guys afterwards. Um, but thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Nicole, uh, Andrew, and Steve. How are we all doing? Yeah, look at you. Absolutely steaming. Oh, look, the blinds are coming down. That's how you know the sun's out. Um, and so we've taken you to debt and we've taken you to equity. But what happens when you mash those two together? That is the topic of our final, uh, our third and final panel um, that's going to explore the concept of blended finance in water. And this is somewhat of a hot topic. 
um, uh, of how to mix public uh, development and private capital. So I know that you're going to enjoy this one. Please uh, join me in welcoming again Kathleen from OECD, who is going to be moderating the discussion. And then Julia Macagno, who is kindly joining us from the European Investment Bank, as well as Anna Giros from Suez. Welcome, all of you. Thank you for being here. All right, everyone. Uh, so we're back, and uh, this panel, I have to say, effectively does strikes the the right gender balance. I think we we evened out the session in in one uh, stroke. So well done there. Uh, okay, so the sun is coming out uh, outside. Uh, we've had some optimism and some pessimism on the previous panel. So I'm curious if I will also have one glass half full, one glass half empty. We'll see. We'll see. Um, we'll be talking about the topic of blended finance, and before we get going and introduce our speakers, I just want to see a, a show of hands uh, in terms of if you're familiar with this term, blended finance. Yeah, okay, okay, so a little bit of a mix. Okay, so we're going to dig into to that and explore what, what we're talking about, and it may be different things. Okay, so, but to kick off, um, please, Anna, and introduce yourself. Okay. Thank you. It's working? Good. So a word on Suez. Suez is a little company in environmental services. We are in the five, co five continents of the planet, operating both in the waste recycling and also on the water. And on the water side, we do from management, from infrastructure, to uh, non-revenue water optimization. So, and, and our latest... Um, I said in the previous panel, acquisition was geowater technologies, and now we have really a vertical integration in, in products. So my uh, name is Anna Giraud, so I'm in the executive committee of Suez, in charge specifically of Latin America. Hello. So my name is Julia Macagno, and I come from the European Investment Bank. I actually work in the Urban Development Division. Uh, but we have very, very strong ties in, um, in the project directorate where I work uh, between us and um, people working in uh, water, people working in transport, because of course we invest in cities and by definition investments in cities is multi-sector. Um, and I work specifically on things related to climate change in cities, so that's why I'm here. And uh, just very, very briefly, the EIB is um, one of the major lenders in the water sector. Uh, you all know what the EIB does, I hope. Uh, otherwise, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, in the past five years, we have signed uh, more than 20 billion um, in loans uh, for, um, for the water sector. 90% uh, of course is inside the EU, which is uh, our main focus, but 10% of that amount is still a huge amount and uh, has gone to projects outside the EU. Uh, so our strength is really to try and um, put together what we learn uh, and the, also the financial products and the solutions that we develop inside the EU and try to uh, match them with the needs of um, countries outside the EU. Excellent. Thanks so much. So a lot of expertise on our panel. Um, so just to get started, this whole idea of blended finance, we can think about it in many different ways. Is it public and private finance? Is it different types of finance? Is it development finance and, and commercial finance? Uh, the way we're approaching it is, is trying to use this small amount of development finance we have in a more strategic way to really catalyze a commercial finance, but how do you think about that? How do you th tackle blended finance when you guys are talking about investments at Suez? So taking a bit of perspective, our um, core activity in these days and in the future uh, it will be amplified is to help our customers both on the municipal side but also on the industry side to transition from a linear, uh, pure linear production, so consuming uh, resources, to a circular economy. And we've talked a lot in San Francisco these days of that, about uh, saving resources, about uh, less emissions, and making them, well, preparing their sustainable growth as a company or as a municipality. I in this sense, basically, uh, in emerging markets, this is more true that maybe in Europe or in the US, in the emerging markets, 
uh, where there's a huge gap on infrastructure, where um, they need to build urgently resilient because of climate change impacts. Basically, the cornerstone, as we see it, is finance. And, and finance, at the end of the day, is not that easy because we could go to governments and they could have a, a private, uh, private investment or a public debt or one single set of finance. But it's not working because uh, no one is able, with the huge amounts that we are talking about in infra, uh, nobody is able to raise that type of funds. So blended finance and a multiplayer approach trying to get together development banks, commercial banks, private sector, uh, public sector, we get to, uh, to get started some projects and some uh, really, uh, really uh, big things that change quality of living, that uh, improve uh, the, climate, uh, the climate fight, um, in, in especially in emerging markets. And this is where Suez has a role to play as part of this multiplayer approach. Excellent. So you're highlighting basically how, you know, no one can really do it alone. All of these different buckets of finance and p potential sources of finance is just not enough to cover it. So you've got to bring more people to the table. And Julia at EIB, uh, how do you guys look at blended? Yes. So blending is actually, from our perspective, we are a policy-driven institution. And we start from the um, assumption that public finance public resources are scarce. So we should use the public resources in a way that is as efficient as possible in order to uh, catalyze other investors uh, and, and attract um, other sources of finance. So um, the way we look at it is normally through um, a combination of lending and grant-based uh, instruments. So we don't um, ourselves uh, give grants, but we work together mostly with the European Commission, and the European Commission provides us, uh, in many cases, with guarantees that we can use to actually reduce the risk uh, of certain investment with the idea that if we invest in and uh, there is a first loss coverage, for instance, we'll get back to that in a minute, but um, this helps. Um, other, company, other private companies to actually uh, intervene in sectors and projects in which they would like to uh, invest, but either they cannot afford the risks because uh, the risks are too, are too high or because uh, maybe the revenue streams uh, and the cost recovery is not there or not entirely there to justify a private investment. Excellent. Okay, so that's a very good illustration of how some of the public actors can use instruments like guarantees or structured funds with first loss provisions, etc., to make that you know investment proposition uh, more attractive. Right. So this is about essentially growing the pie. So how is it done? I mean, give us some examples. So can you give us some illustrations of, of actually what you're doing? How, how, does it, how does it really work on the ground? Sh sure, I will be very concrete because I think it, with examples it's easier to understand. So let me uh, go to Latin America because it's uh, the continent I know best and a continent where more or less 43% of private investing in infrastructure is done. In, if we sum up all the private investing in emerging countries, 43% uh, is in Latin America. So, and it's been pretty successful. Of course, we will always find projects that have gone wrong, but we have a lot of successes. And uh, as Swiss, I will uh, try to illustrate with a few ones. Uh, first, Mexico. Mexico, uh, quite long ago, they created a PPP law, dedicated with uh, bank guarantees, uh, so basically uh, Mexican bank guarantees in uh, fideicomisos, because uh, in the PPP, as it is long term, at the end of the day, what uh, it counts is the security of payment because we make the investment upfront. And we have four PPPs already in Mexico running in the water sector, so basically wastewater treatment plants, and we are about to close a fourth one uh, with a major first investment of uh, 20 million in infrastructure, very close to here in Tijuana for a desalination plan. So PPP is basically a private, uh, private sector invest in the CAPEX. Both models in uh, the lenders of the private banks would invest uh, in debt and uh, the industrials like us, we invest in equity. 
And then afterwards, uh, the, the, the government, Mexican government, uh, fits a fideicomiso that guarantees you all the, your revenues during the 20 or 30 years of ONM of this infrastructure. So that's a good, uh, that, that's been very successful in Mexico, I think, for, for everybody, for the population, for the government, and for people like us that at the end of the day invest in technology, we operate it up front, and then afterwards we, trans we, we, we give it back to the public sector to continue its end life operation. Uh, that's one, one uh, element. Uh, I would also like to comment the green bonds with a very concrete application in Chile. In Santiago de Chile, we just raised the first green and social bonds of the country in the water sector, 55 million. And we had three times the offer for that. So we were demanding 55 million. We had uh, uh, three times that value that was offered to us. And as said before and, and clearly explained, uh, we were auditing why we wanted that money and in, where, in what that money would be spent. So basically it's Aguas Andinas, that is the biggest water utility in Chile, that is a subsidiary of Suez, that raised those bonds. And we, it was another uh, subject, it's not infrastructure, it's about investing in resilience and in, uh, in uh, sustainability in our ongoing operations. And linking also to the last panel, it was about creating biofactories out of our wastewater treatment plants. So instead of thinking uh, our classical way of thinking wastewater treatment plant, uh, uh, wastewater in and uh, more or less clean water out, we are thinking of wastewater in and resources out. So bioresources, and it's a factory producing bioresources, is no longer a wastewater treatment plant. And all this packed up and uh, clearly, uh, uh, cl clearly identified, we raised 55 million of uh, green bonds. So that's a great achievement. Yeah, excellent illustrations, not just of uh, different ways in which blending can be done, a uh, PPP model, tapping green bond market, but also different types of water investments can be, can be, uh, can be addressed this way. And Julia, for, for EIB? Um, so I would like to um, say I have three, let's say, uh, examples. I will try to keep it short, but um, are you familiar with the investment plan for Europe, the Juncker plan, and um, the uh, European Fund for Strategic Investment, which is the, what we call EFSI. We love acronyms in the EIB. Um, this is uh, basically a way in which uh, we can use EU Commission guarantee uh, for um, to invest in riskier projects, projects for which we wouldn't be able to actually provide our finance uh, without uh, such a guarantee because they're too risky for the risk profile of the bank. Um, so this is one way where, for instance, in the water sector, uh, we have done, um, well, I know Italy is my country, so I'm going to use, uh, you're going to forgive me for uh, examples from Italy, but um, we provide basically long-term financing, which is very important. We've heard it before. Uh, long-term financing with good um, interest rates, uh, which is particularly difficult to raise for uh, utilities, particularly small utilities. Uh, and in many countries, including Italy, we have, so I'm not talking just about developing countries, but parts of uh, EU countries as well. You have situations where utilities are trapped in a situation of uh, poor investment, poor performance, inadequate cost recovery, which also leads to poor investment. So it is very difficult for them to raise capital to upgrade uh, the existing infrastructure. Um, so what uh, we could do through the uh, FC instrument was to provide um, small utilities, we did one in, uh, in Palermo actually, um, uh, with long-term uh, loans uh, that allow them to actually improve the state of their, uh, of their infrastructure. Um, another way in which we could use blended finance is, and we get back to the bonds, I think it's the hot topic today. Um, we have developed um, a, pro a project which is called the Hydro Bond, 
Um, and this was basically, uh, again, mm, taking advantage of the fact that uh, in Italy you have the Italian regulation that allows uh, SMEs to issue mini bonds. Um, so we basically were able to bundle up a number of uh, mini bonds um, to diversify the risk and uh, through a, a guarantee, uh, a first loss cushion actually, uh, provided by uh, regional authorities in Italy, uh, these, muni these mini bonds became um, accessible for us in terms of investment and also to other uh, institutional investors like pension funds in Italy. So we managed to provide um, 20 years, um, a 20 year tenor uh, to um, small bond issuers uh, compared to what they could get from commercial banks, which are four, if they're lucky, five uh, year um, loans with a much higher interest rate. So these are the ways in which we are trying to, um, uh, to intervene and to actually facilitate the life of um, small companies, but also in general uh, private investors. And another way in which we can help is actually by our uh, presence in a certain market or by our presence in financing certain projects because we can have uh, a huge catalytic effect. We bring trust. So other investors that would look at certain markets but uh, may be a bit afraid of going in there themselves, see that the EIB is there, know that we have a very clear um, due diligence and, uh, and we bring in uh, a certain level of confidence in the quality of the project in which we invest. And therefore, we help also develop asset classes that uh, are not, were not necessarily open to all sorts of investors. Um, and one final point, I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of time, but one final point is on um, a provision of technical assistance. And I think this is very important. Another way in which uh, blending works for us is actually to bring in, to use grant-based uh, instruments, to provide technical assistance, to improve the quality of the projects, to make them to a stage where other investors may be happy to, um, to put their money in. And... Um, in the water sector, we could use the example of the what we call the natural capital financing facility uh, that helps. Um, it does a lot of things, but among the all the things, it uh, it helps develop uh, green and blue infrastructure. Uh, for instance, we are doing a project now in in Athens where uh, we are actually helping them with technical assistance and the loan to um, integrate. Um, green and blue infrastructure in their thinking uh, in terms of uh, uh, municipal investments. So uh, we are talking about um, sustainable urban drainage systems, we are talking about uh, flood risk management, flash flood risk management. So uh, these are all aspects that um, the private sector alone cannot tackle because they don't, uh, they're not revenue generating, but they are important to ensure that the investments are actually resilient and they bring the benefits they are set up to, uh, to deliver. Excellent. So m several il illustrations there of how EIB is bringing really kind of its range, its toolbox to bear on trying to solve some of these financing issues in, in different parts of of Europe, um, and also in terms of bringing in the resilience angle as well. I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. Now that we have an idea really concretely of how different blending approaches can work, let me just say, as for just short answers this time, um, I'm, I want to test your, test your optimism about the potential for blending. Uh, one thing that we see in our research, and we hear a lot, Tom said this when he introduced the panel, Blending, blended finance is a hot topic, indeed. Every, people are everyone's talking about. It. We say blending is trending, right? You can see a growth of funds and facilities focused on this issue. Is there something new here? Is there really potential to grow the pie, or is this just old wine in new bottles? Is just this kind of same instruments that we know, same structures, okay, but more of the same? Anything new happening there? I think. Uh, we need to be a bit realistic. So it's a lot of fashion and a lot of excitement, which is great because 
in, in fact, there's the need of infrastructure and there's the need of efficiency. And in the other hand, there's capital in the market. So everybody's excited on new topics and trying to, uh, to mix needs with uh, finance and, uh, and do something. Uh, I think we need to be very realistic on the barriers. And uh, what, what is happening really in the projects that do not succeed and why they don't succeed. So I, I think knowing well uh, um, the PPP structures that is one of the classical blended finance that we have, uh, we have to be careful with the countries that don't have dedicated legislation. I mean, security of pay payment, I was saying before, it's, it's an issue. And we have countries like Peru that with Pro Inversión, they, uh, they have dedicated agencies for that. And uh, I was talking about Mexico that has a dedicated Fideicomiso for that. So it's not that easy if there is not a thorough organization and legislation around it. This is one thing. Second thing, and linking to the advisory of the development uh, banks, to the municipalities or the governments, I think we need to de-risk those projects because most of the time it's huge amounts uh, for long term and they cannot be bankable, all of them. So we need the development banks to, in this very, very preliminary studies and planification of the municipalities, uh, have their eye on the risking of bankability, of having them well organized, if not the private capital will not come. So that's the second, for me, the second barrier. And of course, the third one, and thinking of Latin America, but I guess the whole world is the same in these times, uh, it's the political stability. Because it's long-term projects, a blending final is nice, but you have a lot of factors, so you have to get them all organized around a project, around the bankability, about the terms, and you need political a will and political stability and continuity to make it happen. And not just this, but also vertical integration. Because uh, on water, and we know it well, the things happen at municipal and local level. Most of the policies are done at state level. So if we don't link uh, state with municipal, it doesn't work. Okay, excellent. So what I hear is cautious optimism from you then that this is doable, it's hope, hope. but <laughs> yeah, it's hopeful, it's hopeful, but pragmatic. Yeah. Julia, what do you think? Is there something new here? Is What is really the potential to grow the pie? Well, I, I think that um, we're looking at, at different aspects. I very much share uh, what you just said because um, this is also very much part of our due diligence as the country the, um, the adequate uh, legal framework are the, is the recourse uh, system in place uh, is the stakeholder um, consultation done properly so that we avoid having uh, massive um, issues with the local population all of this is of course um, something that we need to be aware of and um, unless I mean we manage to uh, get all these things in place, whatever we do in terms of investment mm, has, is a very, has a very high risk of failure. Um, I think what is very interesting from us is also the, the investment in, um, in innovation. And I would like to tie in with um, what has just been discussed in the previous panel. Because um, with some, uh, with patient uh, investors and uh, a, a good use of um, first loss pieces, for instance, we can really help um, good companies that have solid concepts, um, that have projects that may be bankable, but either um, the, 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 the benefits, the economic benefits occur over a long period of time and therefore uh, if we're looking at uh, short private equity type of investment, uh, the, the time is, uh, is just too short. Or, um, or proof of concept things that really need someone to believe in them and, uh, and give them some uh, uh, initial oxygen and then they can run with it. So I, I'm really happy to hear about uh, innovative, um, innovative industries and innovation also in processes, in traditional industries, because uh, this is also um, something that uh, is, is very, very interesting for us. And um, I also think that 
the collaboration between different types of actors. The fact that increasingly we are uh, less and less actually working in silos and we are collaborating with city networks, with um, industry associations, uh, with corporates. This uh, will help building the collective knowledge that will actually uh, help uh, addressing part of the challenges that we that we have discussed. So yes, I'm quite hopeful. I have to say. Oh, okay, excellent. So so more more optimism and, and sun uh, coming out there. Um, we we only have five minutes left for this. So just I'm going to ask a couple of just quick questions here, uh, for in quick responses uh, before we do the final conclusions. What I hear a lot when we talk about these examples is just really the work it takes to kind of get the right people around the table, sort of balancing out the risks and returns in terms of getting the risk appetites right and who wants to be involved, et cetera. It sounds like a lot of work. Uh, I mean, is this, is this scalable or is this just good old fashioned deal making one, one at a time or, or is, there, is there a way to scale? Any thoughts, Julia, you want to start on that one? Well, I think it is scalable, um, knowing that we are um, increasingly testing and piloting different things, but the idea is that once the model is running, it would be replicable in a number of uh, countries, in a number of situations. Of course, it takes a lot of work and we are not necessarily, I mean, we pilot uh, several things and maybe out of 10, there is two models that actually work. So uh, I think we are still in a stage where the, the loss uh, is actually quite, the risk of loss is actually quite, uh, quite high, but um, we have to, to think about critical uh, mass and, and size. And I think if we manage to uh, identify the right level of uh, investments and the right level of, uh, uh, of people, do we need to act at the local level? Do we need to uh, have interlocutors at the national level? Then, yes. So I very much also share your thoughts about the vertical integration. I think this is very important. Great. Yeah. Anna? Yeah, I, I share it completely. I think this, we are talking a lot about this uh, magic triangle of innovation, no? Uh, I don't know, for instance, me, an engineer, talking about blended finance, it's strange, but it's like that because finally, industrial companies, we were very focused on technical innovation and that was the heart of what we were doing. Then we realized that we also need to work on governance innovation. So we have mixed companies with municipalities to make sure the governance is right and priorities are set, not only thinking at the private one, but also balancing with, uh, with the public pri priorities. And now it's the finance innovation. So we have this magic triangle that has to work, so it's complex by definition. But in fact, on the one hand, it's replicable because once we've learned, we can capitalize on what we've learned. And, this is, and we give a lot of... Uh, I mean, in our day-to-day -day life, we give a, a lot of advice also to our customers and we show them references elsewhere and we show them and uh, we try to capitalize on that and not start from scratch every time. This is the first thing. And the second thing is that at, in the water sector, because the revenue stream is, is very long-term because then very stable, uh, finally it's long-term projects. So once you've built a BOT in Mexico and San Luis, you have this BOT for 20 or 30 years years, it's a very streamlined revenues, uh, growing with demography, so basically it's a wonderful tool for pension funds to invest. So once you've done the initial investment to build a project, to uh, construct the EPC CapEx, then you have 20 or 30 years of revenues. That's great. Okay, that's really encouraging. Sorry, can I just yeah. add one thing, uh, because I just thought about it li listening to you right now. I think knowledge sharing is crucial. And I, I really would like to spend a couple of words on, I mean, at the AIB, we are really trying to work in particular, I know cities, so with city networks, to make sure that we have twinnings of different cities, that we try to transfer lessons that we learn in one country uh, to another country. This uh, is one of the crucial elements of uh, being able to scale it up. Okay, excellent. So we've heard a lot about uh, innovation on the technology side, but also on the finance side, and also in terms of working with partners. So when we started this panel, um, I asked who was familiar with blended finance. About half the room said yes. Can I just check again now who feels 
like they're somewhat familiar with blended finance now. All right, all right, okay, so mission, mission accomplished. But okay, in the, really in just the last minute we have to wrap up, what is just key takeaway you would want people to remember about uh, blended finance? Just one message, one line. I think uh, the core thing is that we need to work together and that multiplayer approach in the water sector is a must. And maybe if I add, add one thing is that water sector brings a lot of opportunities. It brings opportunities for business and for investors, but it brings opportunities to improve quality of living, especially in emerging countries, and it brings opportunities to find against climate change. So we have to stop thinking of water sector like just water utilities, but a real, real sector that will drive the future. Great, thank you. Julia? So for me, uh, the key thing is actually to, to use um, each stream of finance for the things that they're most useful for. Grants and private investors have to work together, and they do different things, and they're both needed at the same time. Perfect. Well said. I think we confirmed the um, the earlier point that women uh, really ha have the what was the wisdom all, all, the, all the wisdom about the future. I think there is something there. Okay, help me join uh, in thanking the panelists. Thank you so much, Kathleen, uh, Anna, and Julia. So, just before we um, I, I wrap us up in just a second, um, uh, we would like to welcome Hank back to the stage to pull a few of the threads together before we move on with the rest of our day. Hank, thank you. Yeah, I won't wrap this up because it's impossible. Uh, I want to <laughs> uh, thank all speakers and panelists for uh, uh, all your ideas and uh, uh, also your commitments, because I think that's where we started off. We need that type of commitment. I will just take some lines I heard and uh, mix them up a bit uh, and take the freedom to do that. I heard uh, in the first panel, the future of finance is about financing the future. Um, and that is, uh, they didn't say it like that, but this is how I'd like to frame it. So uh, I like it from moving from a 15 seconds to a 50 year. Uh, and this is really uh, one uh, part of the, uh, the way forward is how you can increase that time frame because the revenues will come back, but you need to be a little patient, and that is sometimes tough in the financial sector. Second, I think we need to broaden the scope. It wasn't discussed a lot. I pushed it from the beginning, from the valuing water, that we have to look across where these added values actually come to bear. Uh, if the water sector is doing it right, the added value is outside of the water sector. Eh? It's in our environment, it's in our education, it's in equity, it's in our cities, it's in our, uh, and so forth. But if we fail as a water sector, the risk is also felt outside of the water world. So uh, we have wars, we have migration, we have uh, uh, environmental degradation, and so forth. So finding a mix in and making these connections not only in time, but also in scope, is critically important. So. The, those two, circular, eh? uh, water is a source and a resource, but in, in whatever way, if it's dirty, it's still a resource. Uh, uh, we can clean it, we can use the sludge, uh, capture energy, uh, use the leftovers, there's like no, nothing left, uh, so we can use it in any way. Knowledge and data, you can't manage what you can't measure. Do we have the right instruments? I think we actually have a lot of instruments. Sharing that type of knowledge is critically important. I, I heard in the panel with the, the two innovators on technology, can we track the impact on the SDGs? Yes, we can. We actually already do. Eh? But if we don't have access to those tools on every scale, uh, it's uh, tough. The challenge is like bigger than can fit in the bay. Uh, uh, it's massive. At the same time, it's scattered around the world and it's different everywhere. Uh, so that's also tough. It's different than mitigation where you can set a standard and implement it. Uh, every measure you have to take, being in a small community here or in Bangladesh or uh, 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 the Philippines, uh, Latin America, it's different in all these places. So that's the tough part of water. And the businesses are small, uh, uh, you know, technically or emotionally driven almost. Uh, committed to the solution, perhaps not so much committed to the problem. So scale in finance, bundling it up, 
being able to replicate, also is about scale in technology. Uh, so that's why the triangle uh, mentioned on the innovation in tech, governance, and finance is also about defragmentizing uh, that part. And it's a defragmentizing in different way. Uh, it's defragmentizing in commitment. Yeah? The way we do projects is we build a coalition on the inception phase, and then we leave that coalition behind, and then we look at the project, we build a new coalition, and then we think about finance, and a new, and an implementation is new, so there's a lot of uh, uh, knowledge lost, but there's also no sustainable capacity. The, the, the ones that fund have to be part of the first set of measures and understanding, as much as the ones that start with the thinking about the problem have to be part of the implementation. So there's a continuous learning. So defragmentation across time, uh, important, but also defragmentation across commitment. I'm a country representative. I work in every continent of the world, and I always bring together the donor community because every donor, every NGO, every country, every bank has their own focus. And I really must say that the developing world is going totally nuts. Yeah, because here comes the Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, the US, UK, uh, with their pet projects. Yeah? And we love pilots. So we do a pilot here, and then we do a pilot there, and then the World Bank comes in, and the ADB, and the AERB. So the scattered challenge around the world is actually met with a scattered approach by people that want to do good, but we have to bring that together. So collaboration mentioned. Collaboration is really about making it concise, comprehensive, and ensuring that that commitment stays. Eh? Don't leave. The SDGs say, say, leave no one behind. Yeah, really, literally. Don't leave them behind. Don't drop a drop uh, where you think you can leave it and then continue. No, stay. Uh, uh, build a river, a lake, an ocean uh, out of your commitment. So that's critically important. Um, I heard bonds blended blue big and beautiful, all these bees coming back. So uh, I think they are big and beautiful and small, but that scale is important. Um, youth and gender, luckily the last panel may make everything up. Uh, uh, although I think, um, I don't know, who's the youngest in the room? No, you're not. Uh, uh, I work a lot with the young, uh, with little kids, uh, of course also with presidents, but especially with little kids, students, uh, a water youth network, critically important to include them. Uh, the kids that play in the street now will actually see the year 2100. They will see a planet that's either ruined and wrecked by us or uh, we deal with it, so make sure we do that. Um, and innovation. Um, as I said, we have to focus on the future. Yeah? The solutions will not come from replicating our past solutions. Uh, it also will not come in responding to our disasters. Yeah? The more Florences we have, the more we tend to repair what we lost. That will not get us to the Sustainable Development Goals. That will not get us to the Paris Agreement. That will actually get us nowhere. We have to reinvent ourselves every time, and that is a tough challenge. But if I listen to the people on the panels, uh, I'm pretty sure we can do that. Blended, <laughs> blue, and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Hank, and indeed for all of you uh, uh, for um, being with us uh, this morning. I've just got one or two things that I need to do, and that is, of course, to thank people. So if you could join me in giving firstly a big hand to all of our panelists and the staff of the Exploratorium for being so magnificent. And there is one person who hasn't said a word today, and it's unbelievably, uh, well, it's, it's, it's demonstrative of her character, um, because she's actually responsible for all of this. I didn't do anything. Um, she has, <laughs> just, yeah. Um, she's, uh, I've worked, literally worked beside her um, as she's put this together and she's managed to mobilize what I think you can agree is an unbelievable network of international water professionals to come and uh, be with you for these uh, uh, two hours. She's put in a phenomenal amount of hard, conscientious work in and she's done it with grace and grit. Please join me in thanking Kelly Trott. And I want to leave you with uh, three requests, uh, please. Um, there is a massive opportunity here, so let's all go out and seize it. 
Um, I had the uh, somewhat dubious pleasure of speaking to Goldman Sachs's. Admittedly, he was in ESG, and he was actually a really nice guy, but you know, you've got to bash Goldman when you can. Um, and of their issued green bonds last year, they were 6x oversubscribed. If you issue them, they get bought. So let's issue more of them, and let's get these projects into the ground. The second thing is please help in any way you can. Water is hard. It's really hard. The fact that you get to turn on your tap is a mind-blowing privilege that is the result of the dedication and hard work of an extremely, um, of extremely uh, skilled group of professionals. And so any way that you can help, whether it's shaking their hand on the bus or whatever, or donating or volunteering, um, uh, then please do. But that feeds into my last request, which is make noise. These professionals, do an unbelievably hard job with, as I've said, dedication, skill, but the thing is they do it unbelievably quietly. Really quietly. They do it with, or they do um, amazing stuff and they never let us know about it. It's part of the, mod the modesty. And I think it, we owe it to all of them on their behalf to make sure that we make as much noise about the water side of things as possible. So my last thanks is of course to you all for being here and I'll hand you back to Debbie. Thank you. I have to say, living in the water world, that was very kind. <laughs> um, so I don't know about all of you, but my brain is hurting right now. <laughs> I am not a finance person, and that was there. So I have so many new ideas and thoughts in my head. I can barely stand it. Um, but I do want to say one really quick thing about finance. Without it, we can't do anything. I mean, we are really powerful humans, and once upon a time, we knew how to do stuff without money, but we don't anymore. So um, so I, I'm going to wait and do this at the end, but finance folks, please don't leave. We are going to have a break in just a minute, and I would like you to spread yourselves around the room. And folks who are not finance people, please go and talk to them, because we need to close this divide. We need to figure this out. We need every dollar. I know some folks like you know, rate pair dollars better than private investment, better than every other kind of, of dollar, but, but we actually need every one of them. So, so let's figure this out. We're all smart people here. Um, I also just want to take a minute to thank uh, Imagine H2O because in addition to doing the marvelous panels, they are responsible for this lovely artwork. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that. And another round of applause for them. Um, and I believe we are going to see uh, some poll results. Um, again, we have a great app. Um, and thank you all who are taking part. Um, th this kind of was a trick question, because I don't know about you all, but I think all of the above. But, um, but at any rate, um, we're going to continue to use this. It looks like uh, more frequent and intense droughts was the, was the vote getter. I'm pretty sure that's because we're in California. Um, I think folks from other places might have voted differently. Um, but please, uh, please keep taking the polls. There will be more later. There will also be, if you don't like our app, um, there will be a survey mo monkey option too, I think. Although, where is Miguel? Is that true? I don't know. It is, okay, yes it is. Okay, um, so without much further ado, um, we are gonna flop um, the, we were supposed to have some uh, pop-ups, which I will explain after the break, but instead we're gonna do the break first so you all can get up and walk around. I, I guess you're all welcome. But, but before you move, um, finance folks, can you spread yourselves across the room and raise your hands and seriously go talk to them. You can go over and say, I'm gonna be right back because I have to go to the bathroom, but <laughs> go talk to them. All right, thank you all, break time.